Hey everyone, welcome back to Linux Weekly, Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of open source, Linux, anything else we find interesting, you know, we try to have fun and all that. So if you hate joy, just go ahead and go to, go to find somebody who's angry on YouTube. That's easy to do, isn't it, Joel? Yes, <laughs> it sure is. It doesn't take much work to find people like, oh, I'm so mad about the thing, and I'm like, man, just chill out. You know what? We're going to chill out at least one day a week, and that's what we do every Wednesday. I'm Vin. That was Joel. We got everybody watching us live over on Twitch. A lot to talk about this week. A lot to unpack. Uh, Jill, you have uh, added a new thing to your sticker collection. Yes, I have. Uh, I got my bossy die cut sticker LGC merch in the mail. The one that then made. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> it's so cute. <laughs> it's adorable, isn't it? Yes. It sure See, is. No, no, next time Steve's giving you some <laughs> guff, just stick that on him. Be like, Steve, <laughs> obey. But it, but it looks nice, Ben, and the lines on the obey turned out well. The only little thing problem with this sticker, and it's no big deal because I just have to cut it off, but it came a little bit deformed. <laughs> There's nothing <laughs> wrong with tell. that. You just gotta, you just gotta cut it. But oh, it's well, so I, funny. <laughs> I leave it. That's a. Uh... Actually, I will in in honor of. Uh, 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 this will be a collector's item because it's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> they miscut it. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I finally got the, uh, got it up on Frank. He's hanging yeah, out, doing his it looks thing. good with the t shirt. He's adorable. <laughs> oh, such a fussy, fussy skeleton. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm talking about you. So. <laughs> Aw, and Ven, I just realized that I'm not getting return video, <laughs> lower, lower thirds and such. <laughs> I am sorry. <laughs> like it's a, uh, I'd have to restart I, the show or something. All I gotta do is click oh, a button, Joe. It's not. Just click a, I yeah. know, but I hate <laughs> having to interrupt you, <laughs> but it's part of the fun, nope, I guess. Too late. <laughs> Show's over. All the credits. <laughs> too late. No, nope. mm -mm, we're done. <laughs> There's the credits. All right. So I got a bunch of things going on. Uh. Stacked up things. I did the uh, like beginning of the month ordering. So we got the cheapest, what I would call serviceable test test bench available on Amazon. Nice. Like $28. And, you know, nothing against like, because, you know, they're the ones that Jill knows about them. We yeah. talked about them, like the plexiglass ones that are like, you know, 12, 15 bucks, something like that. Yeah. I still have one out over here. <laughs> this is a metal one with a back plate, you know, something that you could, you know, build out into. So I got that. That's coming. I got everything I need to get that stuck together. What else? Oh, right. So if you didn't watch uh, the game show we do, not really a, game, a show about gaming and uh, gaming <laughs> technology, I picked up the um, this guy. Yeah. So this is the Ooh Apple. The Apple TV. <laughs> yes, the Ooh. The Ooh <laughs> Apple. We bang suggested it on Saturday. <laughs> And uh, either that or if you turn it upside down, it's the prototype M3. <laughs> yeah, the M3. <laughs> That'd confuse somebody. Uh, now, I got that for like five bucks. I'm like, you know what? Why did I get it? I don't know where mine is. I know it's here. It's one of those things. You got something in your house uh, that you know. You know for yes. a fact. It didn't go anywhere. It's in a box <laughs> somewhere or in a drawer somewhere. And you've it's even so hard to get to. That you just rebuy it because no, it's no, easier. No, 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 no. Too, <laughs> too, I, there's an organization in my house. There's no, I can't get to anything. That's, that's, okay. uh, uh, I have too many computers. <laughs> so everything, can't find it. Sold this for $5.99. I said, hey, let's pick it up. We'll do a live stream. You know, this is all that came with, came with a power cord, which is fine. Now, I haven't opened it up, haven't done anything, but I did uh, since Saturday, like plug it in and stuck a cable mm. in the HDMI hole in the back and it, it boots up. It's got a mechanical laptop hard drive in it. That's what's like, do I need, so we're going to upgrade this. We're, we're going to switch this out to an SSD. These things are primitive. This is like yeah, a one gigahertz sure. Intel CPU. I think mm. they got like 256, maybe 512 megs of RAM. And of course we're going to put Linux on it. Now there's the regular Linux, that you can pop on, you can get a thumb drive and like, boop, mm -hmm. put it up. Yeah. Something else that I couldn't find was my remote because I swore I knew where the remote was for oh, this thing. Oh, yeah. So this didn't have a remote with it. And I'm like, I got a remote. I got a remote. I've seen that remote. Couldn't find the remote. No. Got a remote on eBay. 
<laughs> Poor Ben. <laughs> These remote and, you know, like the uh, aluminum, like nice ones that they came with. Those things are like 40 bucks now. I'm like, oh, I know. Are, are you I guys know. like crazy? Yeah. I'm not spending 40 bucks on an Apple remote. Then I look for the compatible ones on uh, Amazon for like 10, 15 bucks. And everyone's like, nope, doesn't work. Why do you need the remote? Because you got to do a little sequence to get it to boot Linux. Got one Absolutely. on eBay for 99 cents. <laughs> I, I just put a bid. I was like, I'll give you a buck for that. And then the bid was ending in like an hour. And I'm like, well, somebody, nope. So I'm getting the remote. <laughs> we got that. We're going to upgrade it to an SSD. We need some adapters for that. All that's been ordered. And we'll do the traditional Linux on it. But what we might do, because it's a little more challenging and you can get a lot more usability out of this if you just have one laying around, is we're just going to put some regular Linux on it. We're going to put Debian on it. Yeah, that, Debian. That's what I put on my Apple It's TV. a very <laughs> involved process because it is. there's a regular <laughs> setup you know like i said there's a nice little bootable thing that we can do put it in the drive and it'll mm -hmm. boot up to a linux Debian's a whole different story we're going to be doing some uh partitioning some custom work and we will uh we'll find out we'll find out that's going to get done and now i'm debating on whether or not i want to buy uh this aja kona lhi card to do a video mm -hmm. on that i just don't know like okay don't want to spend 70 80 bucks on that which it's a really good deal, but all I want to know is like, what is the actual process for getting a AJA Kona card? Because we talked about this a couple of months ago when they added support. The company themselves like did a huge um, pull request to add support for AJA into OBS, and that was like a big thing that they worked on, and they got it integrated, mm -hmm. and it's now added to OBS itself. Unlike Black Magic, it's like we're not helping you do anything. Figure it out. So I want to see what the process is of like getting that compiled and set up. I'm still debating on that. Still yeah. debating. On that. And stick around. I'll tell you about some audio plugins on Linux when we get towards yes. the end of the show. Joe, <laughs> yay! Let's jump into this because everybody was talking about this earlier this week. Yeah. <laughs> now, when I say rethinking window management, what? desktop comes to mind. I don't want to say immediately comes to mind, but if I say, you know, a desktop environment is thinking about the way window management works <laughs> and they're going to redo how that, who would you think maybe would possibly. <laughs> I, I knew immediately who it was, obviously, GNOME. <laughs> so. But you know, it could be KDE Plasma, but no, it, no, it's 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 GNOME. <laughs> well, let me rephrase it like this: If I said KDE is rethinking window management, you, your response would be, "What KDE? Yeah, what? Is what? Yeah." Now, now, when I say what the story is about, this is from GNOME blog. GNOME is rethinking window management. You're like, yeah, that sounds like. Mm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> Good, bad, up, down, left, and right. Window management is one of those areas. Uh, to the blog post, the. Uh, the blog poster, right? I, I've been, who wrote it? I, I don't want to keep saying blog poster. Do, do you tell me who wrote this at the bottom? We're going to go all the way to the bottom. Oh, wow, this is long. Uh, Tobias, Bernard. T there yeah, we go. Tobias, Tobias wrote. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tobias wrote. Uh, you know, he's been fascinated with it for 50 years. Nobody's cracked it. And uh, we've relied on, relied on the window metaphor as the primary way of multitasking on the desktop. In this metaphor, each app can spawn one or more rectangular windows, which are stacked by most recently used moved resource. Okay. Here's, uh, I don't know. I, I looked at this. Mm -hmm. I looked at this and uh, my first takeaway is uh, they're going to be doing a couple things. Let me, let me just put it like this. They want to shake things up. They're going to be working on a new type of window management, as we've already covered. But they're going to have not one, not two, but three potential layout states. Mosaic, yeah. edge tiling, and a floating window system. And on top of that, they're going to be working on a system that's going to like automatically do what, and I'm quoting here, automatically do what people probably want, end quote, and fully integrating the workspace into the workflow. And they also bring up that this type of tight integration is going to require richer metadata from the apps themselves. There are some videos on here. There's some videos on here. Mm -hmm. so no one panic. Let's, let's, let's take a look and see. Because I'm at a weird state. I'm at a weird state where um, 
I like familiar, but I also like new. You yeah, know, I, I also yeah. like, I was uh, super excited about um, when Canonical was working on Mirror, remember? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, because they were going to have the, the, the synergy back and forth from the mobile desktop, to desktop experience yeah. and all that. And I went through all the trouble of like early days of getting that compiled and set up, and I used it, and I went, nope. Oh. I mean, eventually Canonical went nope too, but. Yeah. So here we go. Um, Mosaic, new window management mode, uh, combines the best parts of tiling and floating, edge tiling, window splitting the screen edge to edge, and floating the classical stack. So let's see what we have in this first video. Okay. All right. We're playing Tetris. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, all right. Hmm. What do we think about that? So you close one and they automatically move to like kind of maximize the space? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that's kind of a cool idea. If it works. Let's see what number yeah. two looks like. Okay. We drag the one from the button. Ah, and it goes full screen. A full screen. All yeah. Right. So I'm like, all right, well, I got, I want to full screen this one. Now, my first thought about that is that that seems more involved than just double clicking on the title bar. Mm hmm. Which I don't know how it works under GNOME currently. I know in XFC, if I want to full screen something, I just double click on the title bar and close it. Let's take yeah. a look. I usually just expand. <laughs> Number three. We drag that to the left. Ah, and it turns everything to like a tile. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah very, ni very nice. Now, immediately by the shape of these tiles, I'm like, yes, for the software developer. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, and as the article talks about, not all apps work well in a vertical tiling environment. <laughs> so, obviously, like video editing apps, for instance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's it's good for like the weather notifications and uh, widgets and whatnot. Let's see what this mm -hmm. one does. Okay, so if we drag that, is that going to split it automatically? All right. Yeah, it's kind of cool. I actually really like the concept. They're calling it mosaic, which is combining tiling and floating windows. I think it's they're doing it very well. It's well done. Getting additional thoughts on that? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's really nice that I, I think it's really nice that a lot of thought is going into the future of window management on Linux and GNOME. And System76 is also working heavily on new window management paradigms for their up-and-coming Rust-based Cosmic Manager. But like Finn, I'm trained in the old-school way of window management. You know, whether it be floating like with, with the common desktop environment, stacking with TWM or IceWM, or tiling with one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite window managers, Rat Poison. <laughs> and you know, honestly, for me, one of the reasons I like to use multiple monitors is to avoid the window trappings of floating or tiling. So I can have multiple apps open full screen on several different monitors and have the text enlarged, but an easy layout to use screen mag magnifiers for my half blindness when I need it. So some days my, my vision's better than others. <laughs> so... I'm I'm an unusual use case, I know. <laughs> well, you're definitely not an unusual use case when you say you got a lot of monitors. Yes, this is true, like Ben does. <laughs> ben has lots of monitors. Well, most people have more than one monitor these days. Yeah. Something yeah. Uh, I don't really get onto, but I have, br have to bring up on more occasions that I necessarily would, is with games, because hey, a lot of game developers, that game gets developed on nothing but a laptop. Mm-hmm. There's never oh, any yeah. testing. I'm like, how does this handle when there's more than one screen? And on some yeah. occasions, it, it flips right out. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't load on the center. It loads on the one on the left way on the left hand or side. Vertically you can't in the see middle. Or vertically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, the reason window management has traditionally been left to the users is we know where we want them. Yeah, this is very true. I mean, you know. Uh, that window's gonna, unless it's Thunderbird, this is true, everybody knows this, 
<laughs> uh, that window is going to open right back up where I left it. Mm. Thunderbird still yeah. opens, but it's just like what corner of the screen Thunderbird is going to pick to open in it. <laughs> it just does its thing. I, I'm fine with it. I'm like, all right, we'll just put it back over there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, like physically, like laying out everything, like the layout I have right now, one, two, three, four, I got five applications up and running on the streaming box right now where I want them. And that that's my efficient multitasking experience. Would I trust an application to optimize that for me? Hmm. Yeah, no. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. But there's also something, maybe they're working on this too, is I keep space between my applications because there's still potential things that I might need to get open. Yeah, same here. And I do my best to avoid stacking windows on top of each other. Unless I'm trying to fix something at like two in the morning, then we just get a billion terminals scattered everywhere and I'm completely disorganized. Uh, I, I, I'll try it. I'll try it if I ever catch myself using GNOME. Yeah. When I see well, this, yeah. when I see like that interface, oh, my brain immediately goes to like touch and drag. And, and that's what I was thinking. It, it's very mobile-esque. And in fact, in many ways, you can say a lot of this came about because one of my favorite mobile operating systems, WebOS, with their card system. And uh, GNOME has started kind of implementing some of the features from that OS. And that's definitely the, the concept of Mosaic is definitely very similar to the idea of WebOS with like, instead of windows, but cards moving around. <laughs> so, mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And yeah, I, I think they, they looked at, for instance, how to multitask on the iPad, which is not the greatest experience, but they, they were trying to think, okay, what can make this better? And what can make the desktop? You know, how can we integrate some of this functionality into the desktop? <laughs> Can't fault them for trying. Yeah, I I'm commending them for trying to make the you know GNOME try better. something different. Try something yeah. different. Like this is a you know maybe it's not your thing. I will always defend like weird moonshot stuff like this. Like hey, we're going to rethink. Now, if you just ask me, like have have we solved UX on the dust stuff? I'm like yeah, we solved that like 30 years ago. Yeah, to me, uh, yeah, <laughs> same CDE. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> like CD is like, and what I would base that off of is like, let's see how much work I can get done under each system. However, I want to see stuff like this, and I champion stuff like this simply because you need people to rethink stuff, and it could never lead to anything, but at least they're trying something different. We get some new ideas. Maybe yes. something else branches off from this initial idea and proposal that is better, or yeah. this turns out and evolves into something that we're like, well, I mean, nobody would have thought about that, but this is awesome. And there you go. So true. And I, and I think also in the future of, you know, the integration of the mobile and desktop, like we were talking about earlier, then with, with Mir, some of the innovations that came out with Mir is, is that, you know, that, that lends itself, uh, some of these changes lends itself to an interface like that, where you can move a window to another monitor or another computer and then the other one you know pops out of the way and slides over so i think a lot of people yeah. like the concept of that and but i don't know where we're going to get there we might <laughs> we might and you know like large monolithic like setups are not very common these days, but everybody's got a laptop, right? Or at least they got some type of touch device. And most laptops yeah. have touch screens on them these days. So, I mean, this is so probably true. the right way to go. And beautiful thing about Linux, choices. You yeah, call it fragmentation, choices. I call it options. I call it yeah. choices. I don't have to stick with anything if choice. I did. <laughs> see something I don't like. I can go try something else I do. So, Absolutely. And, and this is awesome. You know, I, I'm so happy that GNOME is working on this because, you know, it is one of the most used desktop environments on Linux. So it makes sense. They want to improve it or they want to give their users more options. And everybody's trying different things. You got GNOME doing their thing, KDE doing their thing, uh, Pop OS, yeah. whatever those wacky kids are up to. 
over at System76. And then you have mm-hmm. the superior option, which is XFCE, which is a yes. shining beacon of perfection, <laughs> unable to be improved upon. Mine would be Window Maker. <laughs> I love Window Maker. I love Window Maker's fun. I, I still want, uh, to this day, I am like, <laughs> I wish Enlightenment would get more stable. I know. Same here. And I love XFCE too. Actually, right now I'm on XFCE, but but uh, I I go back and forth <laughs> as I feel like it. <laughs> I use XFCE because it is stable. <laughs> yes, XFCE doesn't crash. Like <laughs> the code quality in XFCE, like it's again, well you done. could argue well, it doesn't do a whole lot. But that's You're, the point. Is yeah. that supposed to hurt me? I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's awesome. I just needed to open some windows and like give me a little launcher at the bottom, and we're down. Maybe yeah. some notifications up top. What else do you want? I like right clicking on the desktop and getting my applications like in Window Maker. I guess that's just my old school Unix love coming out. <laughs> I like the option to be able to do that. Yeah, I like it the is option cool. Option to be able to do that where I'm like, uh oh. Ecstasy uh, is nice that way. <laughs> that's usually me locking something up and coming over here to this monitor. I'm like, can I get the mouse over here? Oh, yeah. boy, right there click. we go. Right. Yeah. And we get lucky sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, use what you want. Everybody at Gnome. Keep rocking on, doing the crazy stuff. Don't listen to any of the haters. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, be weird, be different. You know, you know change. You're awesome. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Now I support the Gnome Foundation. So. Talk about <laughs> Waterfox is back from being a uh, advertising browser. Yeah, so way back in February of 2020 on LWW, we talked about the web browser Waterfox joining the System One advertising company. Well, now Waterfox, the privacy focused web browser, has regained its independence and is parting ways with System One, which, you know, I'm actually kind of happy about. <laughs> They're independent again. And part of this reasoning is there was concern about the Waterfox's future trajectory under the System One ownership. And with this transition, Waterfox users like me can breathe a sigh of relief. You know, as the browse, browser renews its focus on privacy, customization, and performance. And Alex Contos, who is the driving force behind Waterfox's success and the creator and lead developer, will continue leading the project, Bravo, which is a promising sign for its, you know, community and for all of us users. And Contos actually emphasizes that the newfound independence opens doors for faster development, cool new features, and a better user experience. And in the coming months, he will be working very diligently to advance the browser, you know, focusing on improvements and enhanced privacy, boosting performance, and memory utilization and expand lots of customization options. And so I was so happy to hear this. Uh, you know, Waterfox actually became very popular about 11 years ago and was a very fast alternative to Firefox and a great option for the security con- conscious. And it's unique because Waterfox still uses Zool or the XML user interface language which is a user interface markup language actually developed by Mozilla and used extensively to create add-ons, although Mozilla isn't relying on Zool much anymore. And I actually used to use Waterfox on a regular basis, and I'm hoping that its newfound independence will bring it back as a go-to alternative browser. In fact, Waterfox really has a head start for a web browser focused on security, especially then in you know, today's world and age where most browsers are shifting in that direction and there are a lot of options available. They were ahead of the game way back when, before people were even really, really seriously thinking about security in the browser. So I want, I want them to succeed. <laughs> and I do know some, quite a few other people who use Waterfox like me. So th- this was really, really good news. I was so happy about this. 
Yeah. Uh, Waterfox exists. That's about all I, I don't really have anything to say positive or negative, but I do remember talking about like, well, they're going to be in Edgum. You know, that's, that's a horrible match, right? I mean, if you yeah. don't understand like why that's a bad match, <laughs> uh, go ask Google. Yeah, go ask Google. I mean, if you wanted ads in your browser, that was probably the future of Waterfox. <laughs> Google is being owned yeah, by an advertising, advertising company, company that yeah. has a browser. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh one downside about waterfox they don't have a mobile version oh yeah that's true but there are two versions there's the the regular version in fact that just had an update and then there's the waterfox classic which i still like to use too and that was that was nice that they have both options available for those that like the, the classic universe user interface and those who like the more modern one mm. So really and I, I'm like looking through like some of the main settings. It doesn't look like you can like just disable WebRTC in uh, Waterfox without using like about config. Mm. You got to dig okay. around and do that. Um, yeah. Which I mean, you know, privacy nuts are gonna be like, gotta get they're spying on me. Yeah. So, <laughs> be aware Let's of that. See. That's a good. That's a good thing for them to look at. Mm -hmm. That's a browser. We need more browsers. Uh, Firefox based because we have a ton of. You know, things based on Chromium, so more stuff based on Firefox is always good. Yeah, absolutely. I'm championing anyone who's doing something that's not Firefox or Chrome based. Gnome Web for the win. <laughs> There's a couple of projects that aren't Gnome. Um, I don't even know. Like, is what is Gnome Web? Is that like their built-in? Yeah, that's that's their built-in. It's completely independent source code. So that, that's pretty cool. And they're really, they're really actually um, making that one a more, um, a full featured web browser now. Originally, it was just, you know, just to read articles and tutorial on the oh, Gnome it's web desktop. Kit. Yeah, it's WebKit, but it's, it's, uh, they're, they forked it and it's, yeah, it's really changing. <laughs> yeah. Epiphany. Yeah. yeah. Epiphany. Yeah. That's, that's the original name was Epiphany. So, uh, yeah, I would, uh, there was a couple of people. I know the one guy we talked about who was just like, I'm going to write one from scratch and oh, I yeah, compiled it and that. I managed to like get it to launch yeah. and like, there's still a long way to go, but I, I want, it's such a daunting undertaking to create a web browser. Yeah. And when oh. I, it can take a team to do it and something like this, go check out Waterfox. If, uh, that's your thing. If Firefox is too mainstream for you. Yeah. It's forked from Apple's. Uh, WebKit, but WebKit actually originally was uh, KDE. So, yay! One of KDE's browsers. Now, code. <laughs> what is uh, Canonical up to? Because you got a big long paragraph about yes. a kernel. <laughs> so, I dare you to make that entertaining. Uh, <laughs> so, this is something that is actually really huge for Canonical. And will further increase you know, the speed of Ubuntu Linux for industrial enterprises, including telecom workloads, automation systems for the factory floor, and life-saving medical equipment, which is extremely important. So Conical just announced real-time Ubuntu Linux optimized for Intel Core CPU SOCs for Ubuntu 22.04 LTS. This, this is pretty big news. In February, actually, Canonical announced the availability of their real-time Ubuntu kernel for Ubuntu 22.04 LTS Jammy Jellyfish for users with an Ubuntu Pro subscription. But now, Canonical has optimized its Ubuntu RT kernel for Intel Silicon, which will actually enable enterprises to use the power of Linux for a wide range of use cases. And with this expansion of the real-time Ubuntu kernel, Canonical addresses actually the growing need for real-time capabilities among enterprises that want to improve efficiency, optimize operations, and guarantee reliability for mission-critical systems. Very important. And the solution is actually supported on Intel Core SoC processors with the Intel Time Coordinated Computing and Intel Time Sensitive Networking Protocols. And this includes the newest 12th gen Intel Core processors, codenamed Alder Lake S, but more platforms will be announced 
shortly. And uh, th this is this is really big because as Ven Ven can tell you, the important importance of a real time kernel. Um, I've used it here on LWW for doing audio of Jack, and he uses it on a daily day to day basic basis to uh, run our run Linux Gamecast network. <laughs> Very important. So it's really getting going to, you know, help improvements in areas where you need to applications need to talk to each other over a network instantaneously, like when when our doctors are doing surgeries and that and uh, you know the back end for those needs. Now, uh, this is from 9to5linux.com. The uh, article Jill was quoting was, uh, who wrote it? Marius Nestor. Yeah, So Marius. I want you to go back and give that a check. When it comes to real-time kernels, uh, yeah, they're awesome. They're even more awesome when they're not behind a paid subscription. Yeah, <laughs> which you can't, you can install <laughs> our, our real-time. And Ubuntu. You know. Canonical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, you want this? and can give it some money. Like, how about I just install Debian? Use that RT kernel. Yes, which which I am using actually right now. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, uh, most people have no need. No, this is for enterprise. Uh, do I use an RT kernel here? Yes, I do. Do I have to? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. But for desktop usage, audio stuff like that, what you want is not a full RT kernel, but you want something with preempt enabled. Mm -hmm. You want mm -hmm. preemptive. Why? Less complications. Because you will run into, um, now it's a much better situation than it used to be. Like if you try to, let's say you have, you're part of the 80 something percent of the population that has an NVIDIA GPU. You, you try to do that. Most people don't know how to install NVIDIA drivers, mm -hmm. which irritates me to no end. You know, it's like, well, I can install them from the automated packaging system. And I'm like, yeah, but you need to learn how to install drivers the right uh, If you try to do that, it's going to tell you no. You try to download the run file to install your NVIDIA drivers, it's going to tell you no, but louder. Mm. And NVIDIA is not going to tell you the moon glyphs to make it work, which you can do. Probably do a video about that one day. Something about, like, don't give children loaded guns. But mm -hmm. um, then you run into other situations, usually for proprietary hardware, like Blackmagic drivers, not having full RT. So, mm. like the box Jill is on, full RT, hard RT. Jackbox, running our audio chain, full RT, threat booper, broadcasting, preempt, not mm -hmm. full RT. Okay. And it still gets the job done. So, um, and there's very rare situations where you would need a hard RT kernel. And again, that's going to be an enterprise automation embedded type stuff on the desktop. I wouldn't even recommend it. That's one of those yeah. things like, you know if you'd need it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Right? Like like in the surgery room. <laughs> so if the doctor wants to communicate with someone outside of the hospital and get it in real time. Uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of this audio stuff, I threw down a little bit of a video. I've been working on this for a minute. Reaper on Linux. Because mm -hmm. nobody's doing Reaper Linux videos. And. Why is it important to do that? Because Reaper's cross-platform. It works on Windows, it works on Mac, it works on Raspberry Pi, which is running Linux. It runs on Linux, running Linux on your x86. You got it, and a ton of people use it. I mean, there's not a whole lot of information about it on Linux. I still, the most common question is, so I run it in Wine. No, it's been native on Linux <laughs> for like quite a while now. And you want to install audio plugins. There's a couple of them, LV2, CLAP, VST, VST3. There's also um, Ladspas, but like they don't work in Reaper, so forget about it. And here's the thing. If you install plugins this way, they're going to work with Reaper, Adore, Bitvig, Audacity, anything that you normally use it with. And you might not know where to start with this. Like, you might not, like, what, what, mm -hmm. what's up? I can't find these dot folders. Where are these dot folders at? Because you got to think, day one Linux, you don't know you need to go in there and sh Enable show hidden files in your home directory. And those are not on by default. Most of the time, somebody's going to be like, no, my distribution does that. They're not on by default for the vast majority. Um, can I show you like, where do the LV2 plugins go? Because sometimes you just copy over an SO file for a library. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to mm -hmm. copy over the entire folder, though. 
Yeah. <laughs> I could see that. Mix and match and the right place to put them in because it can get confusing because your VSTs and your VST2s are going to go in your VST directory, but VST3s, nope, they don't go there. <laughs> they go in your VST3 directory. Then you get the dot clap thing, all that fun stuff. It's yeah. pretty interesting. This will get you up and running in a couple of seconds. And you got to make sure that whatever DAW you're using, whatever audio tool you're trying to get something done with, is pointed at the right spot in your home directory. They usually are by default, but you always want to double check it. So I walk you in and out of that in less than two minutes. Go give that video a watch if you've been, but like that's there for new users. And it that's needs to awesome, be. Ben. I did one about Hollow Knight a couple of weeks ago, right? For yes. modding <laughs> Hollow Knight. And somebody left me a comment on that and they say, hey, that's awesome. You just got to the point. Because, you know, it's like a two minute long video. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. That, that's kind of the point, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, this is how, it do how it's done. You don't now, have to wait. Wouldn't it have been better if I'd made hour that hour Hollow Knight video? <laughs> and instead of, you know, Doing the one and a half minute long video, I spent five minutes telling you what Hollow Knight is. Then I spent another five minutes telling you my personal thoughts on Hollow Knight. And then I spent one minute telling you how to do the thing that I told you I was going to tell you how to do in the video description. YouTube would love that. Yeah. <laughs> They're like tweaking. They suggest like you, you want to make them at least eight minutes long. That way we can put mid-roll ads in them and ads at the beginning and ads at the end. Vin, you're just missing out on this money. <laughs> I'm not here to make money. I'm here to try to help people learn how to use Linux. So let's keep doing stuff like that. Yeah. And if you want to help us do that, hey, head over to LinuxGameCast.com, smash that support button, become a patron, support us on LibrePay, PayPal. We even take that, you know, Bitcoin's worthless these days. It's, it's like negative money. Send us that and we'll turn it into studio equipment for everybody. We get Amazon wish list. If you want to pick us up a little bit of a present, Jill's got one, Pedro's got one, Jordan's got one. I got one for the mm. studio. I always warn you, I will publicly shame you on this board <laughs> back here. Unless you like slip me an extra 20, but um, that's always a fun thing to do. We got a merch store. That's where Jill's sticker came from. That's where the t-shirts yeah. and everything else. And of course, a humble mm -hmm. affiliate link. So yeah, thanks for people supporting what we do, letting us do stuff like just, I think that's a really good example of like, I'm not going to make dumb videos like that because those videos irritate me. When I click on a video and I read a guide, I want to know how to do the thing it said it was going to teach me how to do. <laughs> yes. It's like going to look up a recipe. You're like, I want to know how to make barbecued aardvark. <laughs> and you type in Google, how do I barbecue an aardvark? And the first result comes up and you click on it and it starts out, ah, I was born in a small country town. I'm like, no. I don't need your backstory. I'd need your recipe for aardvark. Yeah. <laughs> so I was so, you know, very appreciative event that you went, went through that all for each individual plugin. Cause I used to have to install hundreds for my 3d animation software. And in those early days, there was no documentation. You just had to figure it out yourself. <laughs> the plugin's pretty oh, basic. Um, <laughs> You do have the options with every distribution because that's going to be one of the common things. I think somebody's already left a comment. And they're like, by the way, I use Arch. You can install a lot of these plugins from the AUR. That's mm -hmm. cool. Um, but I also <laughs> like a lot of the plugins from the KVR audio database. Because like, where then? Where do you get the plugins? That's like one of the first things in the video. KVR yeah. audio database and LinuxMusic.rocks are great resources for stuff you don't know exists. Awesome. And they're not in your R either. And they're not in your Debian repos or your PPAs or your... Debian multimedia. Yeah. These are things you never heard of, and it clutch your pearls, get out your fainting couches. There's also paid plugins, which you can buy that do other cool stuff too. I have a couple of paid plugins. They're not open source, but I always try my best to support anybody who's doing plugin development on Linux. Like I think I own like eighty percent of the um, ACM plugins mm. and. Um, because that guy's got a series of plugins. He's like, these are only available for Linux. I'm like, let's see how many I think I can use. Like, I bought stuff I've never used. I, I just gave Jordan one. I'm like, here, take half a present. Um, yeah, but thank you for your support. We get to do stuff like this. If you back us on Patreon, get access to our Discord. 
you get to watch videos and stuff like that usually about a week early because I put it up for listener feedback. I'm like, hey, you got questions about this? Should we add anything to it? Should we subtract anything? And then somebody's like, well, you need to multiply. And I'm like, we're not multiplying anything. I'm drawing the line there. <laughs> you get this show completely yeah. uncut. Not just like this little 30, 40 minute block. You usually get like an hour and a half, two hour block. The entire live experience because you can't make the live stream. You don't want to watch the YouTube video. You want it in a podcast format. We got you covered. Also, same thing for Linux Gamecast Weekly, except it's usually like three and a half, four hours of us talking about mm-hmm. pretty much anything, including the pre-pre-super shows and a little behind-the-scenes look at what we got going on. We appreciate your support. That's it for our little plug. Let's talk about the biggest the piece big of pie. pie. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Well, I mean, comparative. comparative. Yeah, this is one of the biggest slices of pie we've ever done. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. What is it? Oh, it's this. Okay. So if I, audio listeners, this doesn't work on the video uh, because you're like, I know what that is, man. but you don't if you're listening. If I, if I tell you, hey, man, we're going to get a 64 core system with 128 gigs of RAM. You're like, oh, that sounds pretty neat. I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. Like, that's, that's pretty nice. But then I say, how about we get a 64-core RISC-V based system with 128 gigs of RAM? Mm-hmm. Now we're talking like, wait, what? Woo-hoo. That sounds like a big board. Because that's what Milk 5 technology plans on shipping, not 10 years from now, not four years from now, not next year, in this December. That's not cheap. But why am I bringing that up? We've seen these boards in the past. Maybe not to this extent, not this powerful, <laughs> but the, we've seen ATX, and this is MATX form factor, yeah, approaching, you know, like, and usually they weren't Risk Five; they were ARM boards, and you see an ARM board, like, ooh, that one's got some PCI Express slots on, takes them, you don't even want to ask what it is, you know, like, call for a quote, because they're outrageously expensive. This, this is borderline affordable. You're looking at 1100 yeah. bucks to get the board. Woo-hoo. So that's going to get you the CPU. The heat sink. You supply a case, put some drives in it, good to go. I mean, it's got NVMe on it. Pretty happy with that. Uh, SATA, one, two, three, four, five SATAs. Yeah, pretty sweet. And, I was uh, really happy it has three full length PCI Gen 3 slots. And right? that's, you know, workstation level computing here in a micro ATX form factor. Pretty sweet. So, uh, that's the base model. If you want to give them two grand, you get the board, you get a case, you get a dual 10 gig NIC and uh, like a GPU that technically, GP, an AMD R5 230. Mm, mm, so you yeah. get a vintage graphics card. How much does yeah. an AM R5 230 cost? <laughs> Five bucks. <laughs> They're pretty uh, inexpensive. I have a couple in my collection. <laughs> If I was going to go to eBay right now, because I'm totally not going to eBay right now to see how much AMD <laughs> so Maybe or... $20. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do, do, do we got any takers in chat? Nobody's going to play a game <laughs> with us. There and they're just going to, no, I'm not, I don't care about old cards. Like, have some fun, people. So you say about 20 bucks? Yeah. How, all right, how many could I get uh, eight of them for? Maybe 50? I don't know. Mm. Maybe they'll give you a discount for, for a lot. <laughs> Sixteen ah, bucks. See? I was right. <laughs> yep, there it is. Now but you yeah, can get eight of them for one hundred. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Okay, I was actually originally going to say a hundred, and I said, well, maybe they'll give you a discount for buying bulk on fifty. <laughs> Seventeen Aww. thirty. What can you do with this card? You can get video out of it. That's it. Yeah. And you got to think about this stuff. This is Risk Five, which brings me to mm-hmm. who would want to buy this board? Because if you're looking to start working with Risk Five and do a development based on Risk Five, or you need boards to compile, because you don't want to do cross compiling for some weird reason, there you go. Like mm-hmm. that's it's it's completely reasonable for a workstation board. Yeah, absolutely. And they're they're calling the the one that's fully uh, built the Pioneer box, and it comes with only a three hundred fifty watt power supply, 
which is really low, but this demonstrates the, you know, the power efficiency of the 64 core RISC V. Now, I'd recommend putting a higher, <laughs> higher wattage power supply in there if you're going to use a high end, uh, you know, AI compute <laughs> video card. <laughs> but, you know, out of the box, it'll run. And that honestly is amazing for a 64 core RISC V processor. Oh my gosh, 350 watts? <laughs> that's low. <laughs> and like Ven was saying earlier, the price, that's, that's amazing. I mean, if this, if this was announced a year ago, it'd probably be like, what, five to $10,000 minimally? <laughs> so it's, we've really come a long way <laughs> with the price of Risk Five. <laughs> so yeah, what does it run, Fedora? <laughs> uh, well, the nice thing is last week we talked about the Debian port for Risk Five, the official port. And uh, so eventually Debian will run on it. Woohoo! <laughs> eventually. Uh, so yeah. what, what I'm saying is this is the perfect white elephant gift to get uh, for your Windows buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, here you go. Here's something super cool. It only runs yeah. Linux. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I think it's going to be funded because their initial goal, like these things are already made. I have to explain how this stuff works to people sometimes, mainly because they're curious, not because I don't think you don't know. If you do know, that's great. Uh, when you see like a low goal like this, $50,000, that's this is to estimate how many they need to get packed. These things are already printed. They're ready to go. They need to figure out what they need as far as like shipping, getting these things where. This is logistics pricing. of like, how many people are interested in this? They've already raised two hundred nine thousand dollars, so they got those numbers. So that first batch, you know, that's why they're going to be able to get them out by December. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, as DeCresney says in chat, this is you know a great computer for those of us who use Blender, who use Maya for three D animation packages. But we're going to have to wait a while for all those packages to be ported to uh, the RISC system. So uh, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> what you're looking at, like that with all like. Uh, you might see Maya support in a decade. If you yeah. want Blender, uh, Blender on a Raspberry Pi 4 soon. will probably run circles around this thing. Yeah. This is a true. development board. They stress this and I stress this. This is not for playing around on the desktop. This is a development board for building stuff. Yeah. Like if you're but not was... writing software, <laughs> if your goal is to run software. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ven, like we were talking about last week, you remember how long it took for for ARM compatibility with all the apps on Linux? You know, that that took, I was like, we're still, they're still doing, they're still mm -hmm. porting apps. And what, that's been almost 20 years now. So, <laughs> so it's going to take a while to port all those apps to RISC. That's RISC uh, five. So well, let's see, this thing's Fedora, Debian, Gentoo, Arch, and Ubuntu, Deepin. And see, well, you can get like the big box if you want the Milky V. It's got mm -hmm. it's got a transparent window on it, so that's how you know you're cool. Yeah. Yeah. You oh, can, I like the case. It's nice. You can nice have, like, and compact. Yeah, it's micro ATX or mini ATX, whatever it is. See, look uh, at that. Micro, not mini ITX. Micro ATX. Well, the actually the case looks like it's it 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 could be a mini ITX. I mean, it obviously is if it if it supports micro, but it looks small enough to be a mini ITX case. Well, it is an MATX form factor, and I believe that's... I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. there you go. Run out, drop 1100 bucks on it, and be like, I don't know, put it in a closet for 20 years, I'm sure it'll be worth something. Maybe. Not. All right, we're running a little bit long. We gotta run. Uh, it was awesome. Hang it out. Let's yeah. do some credits. And, uh, boom. <laughs> Aw, Steve has been. <laughs> he said uh, people should put plastic storage bins in my wish list. And instead of a, of a buy me a coffee. People should put <laughs> plastic storage bins in your wish list. Okay, everybody, you heard Joe. Hack her account. Yes, hack my and account. Put some bins in yeah. there. Yeah, Steve has, has been. I need to put. You, you can pick out some plastic bins that I put in my wish list. <laughs> Oh, thank you to our all our wonderful patrons, our sea monsters, our advisors, our death notes, all the people uh, in our Discord chat right now, <laughs> our chairlings. 
LWW 386. Amazing, Ben. <laughs> Wait until you blow up the video full screen and look next to the uh, LWDW. Oh, okay. I will. <laughs> I missed it. Nobody's <laughs> mentioned it. It's been there the oh. whole time in this shot. I've probably noticed it, but I'm forgetting what it was. <laughs> it's right there right now. <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye, everyone.